right hey guys welcome to this part of the lecture so this is where we delve into visual studio and i show you how you can go about building uh, your application so just to recap uh, this is our scenario which we already talked about we want a student information system and this is a summary of how our database looks like based on the design that we have created and the these are some of the uh, use cases that we're going to implement. So this is some of the information we expect to have in our business logic layer. Uh, one of the business processes that we'll use to demonstrate is the uh, registration of a student. So we'll see how this business process is implemented. Uh, and it is actually illustrated here in the form of an activity diagram. Uh, also, we will see how do you design your application in such a way that it's made up of three layers or three tiers uh, in this way. So we'll see specifically how do you create these three tiers uh, in your application. And last but not least, we will see how do you use Entity Framework to enable you read and write your data to your database in the form of objects. And how do you use Link uh, to enable you write queries in your native programming language such as C-sharp and not having to, res to resort to using a uh, database language like SQL. So you just write your queries using your native programming language and you can be able to see the results. Of course, uh, within this demonstration, I also expect to show you uh, how can you be able to create your application in such a way that then since you have divided your application into uh, layers, and we say the presentation layer, this is the user interface that the student, uh, the user comes into contact with and they use it to either enter information, issue commands to the system, view information and so on. So with this kind of design, you can actually be able to create, uh, write the logic of your application in such a way that then you can have two different uh, presentation layers. So you can have one presentation layer which is implemented uh, as a web application, so you have ASP.NET Web Forms or ASP.NET MVC, so you have a web application. And you can also again have another uh, presentation layer that is implemented, for example, as a mobile application. So because the two systems will be using the same database, same logic, the whole idea behind this is to try and avoid having to rewrite the same code over and over again whether you're using the mobile interface or you're using a web application interface, you will still need to do the same reading and writing of data into the database. You will still need uh, to execute the same business processes. And that is basically the wisdom behind splitting your application into these tiers or layers so that then you can have multiple or alternate uh, uh, user interfaces. Another advantage of doing this is uh, so that in case in future, uh, maybe you started your application as an ASP.NET Web Forms uh, interface, but then you realize that ASP.NET MVC is far much better. And so you want to rewrite your application using uh, the MVC interface. So if you use this design architecture, you, the amount of work that you'll have to redo will be very little. It will simply be the code that is uh, required for capturing data and allowing the user to see uh, different views of your system. But most of the code with respect to the business processes, adding objects of different types, updating and so on, that will still remain constant and you can just add another interface. And I think we will demonstrate this particular concept by building uh, both a console application and a Windows Forms application using the same uh, logic and data tiers. So using the same business layer and data layer, we will see how you can create two presentation layers, uh, which represent two uh, user interfaces using two different technologies, either command line interface or a graphical user interface, and you leverage the same, same code. And we'll see how that saves you time and effort writing a lot of code. So I guess without further ado, we'll jump straight into Visual Studio and see how we can get this done. 
All right, so here's my Visual Studio. So let me create my application. So first I just go to File, New Project. And because, because I want to start with a console application, I make sure that I start here with a console type of application. So I type in here, uh, console. So I can search for templates for creating console-based applications. And then I make sure I select console app.net framework. Okay, and I click on next. And this is a very important step because this is where now you can differentiate the different projects and the solution. So let us assume that uh, the solution we are going to create, we're going to call it uh, Olivet Manager. Remember, we created, a we created a database called Olivet. So let's assume our student information system is going to be called Olivet Manager. And up here, the first project, which is the console application, this will be one of the uh, presentation uh, layers. So I'll call it presentation. So I've called the project name uh, presentation and the solution is called Olivet Manager. Then I click on create. All right, there you have it. You can see my solution and the first project is already created. So presentation, this is what corresponds to what we are calling the presentation layer. As you can see here, the first uh, layer, the presentation layer, that's what we've just created. And like we said, this represents a specific user interface. And this, uh, for example, in this case, we're using a command line interface because this is a console-based application. So let's create the other uh, two layers or tiers. So usually the two tiers, uh, the logic and data tiers are created as class library projects. So class library project. So let's create those two tiers and see how all this looks like. So to create another project within the same solution, right click the solution, go to add, choose to add new project. Then like I said, we're adding a business layer. So that is normally uh, a class library project. So I can type here class library you can see I get all the class library templates. Select the one that says class library .net, uh, uh, framework. This one here, you can see there's another one that says .net standard, but make sure you choose the one that says .net framework. I click next. So here I create my second uh, uh, tier. So I'll call it business. I'll click create. So you see now I have another project called a business. And then I create the last one, the last tier as another separate project. So new project, again, class library. Make sure you select class library.net framework. And this one, we call this the data tier. Okay, so you notice that now in my solution, I have three projects. And the three projects are presentation, data, and business representing or corresponding to the three tiers in a three-tier architecture. Uh, so next, I go ahead and uh, implement. So first and foremost, remember we already created a database. And so we are going to use that database to auto-generate uh, classes, okay, for the different objects that we want to create in our database. So what I'll do is, first of all, I'll delete this class file that is in the data layer. And as I do this, I'll also delete the class file that is in the business logic layer. And also, I just need to point out that another advantage of uh, dividing your solution into separate projects in this way is that if you're working as part of a big team, if you're working as a member of a big team in Silicon Valley, uh, the different projects can be assigned to different teams or different programmers. So one programmer could be working on the uh, business layer, another programmer is working on the user interface or presentation, and another programmer is working on the data layer. And then all these can later on be combined together as part of the same solution. So let's now create the classes using Entity Framework. So first of all, I'll have to add a folder to my data layer. So I right click, uh, go to add, 
I say add new folder. Uh, usually this folder is called domain because this folder is for storing the domain of uh, objects or classes that you will create for your solution. So normally we call that domain. Uh, so in this domain folder, this is where I'm going to auto-generate classes that represent my objects based on the database. So this is what we were calling the database first workflow because we already have created a database. Um, as you can see here, we already have our database called Olivet with a bunch of tables. So based on these tables in our database, we'll auto-generate uh, domain classes that represent the objects in our scenario. All right, so to do that, of course, there are a couple of ways, different ways you can do that, but the simplest way for uh, you to do that is you right click uh, the domain folder, go to add, choose add new item, then choose data, and here within the visual C sharp data, make sure you select uh, addo.net entity data model, then give your model a name, so typically the name that is given uh, is normally a name such as school context. Okay, so if you are dealing maybe with an insurance, you would maybe call it insurance context or something like that. And this is to correspond with the different uh, classes that are used to abstract your database. So let's call it school context. And then we click on add. So here we make sure that we select uh, code first from database. So we click on code first from database. We click next. Then here we create a connection to our database. So we create a connection to our database by clicking new. Uh, say we use a Microsoft SQL server. Uh, click on continue. Uh, here we choose local host. And then depending on the kind of authentication you're using, you can use Windows authentication or you can use a username and password for connecting to your database, and then select your database. So our database is called Olivet. I select my database. I can test for connectivity. You can see connectivity succeeds. I click on OK. OK, so that completes the process of creating our uh, context. So I go to the next uh, step. So in this next step, I have to uh, select the tables uh, on the basis of which I want to auto-generate. Uh, objects. So if you remember uh, in our scenario, these are the tables that we have. So I'll just select all of them. So I'll select uh, all these tables except the last one. This is a system generated table in SQL. So I select those tables and click on finish. So of course, uh, Visual Studio takes a couple of seconds to execute. And after that execution, this is what you have. So if we go back uh, to our domain folder, you can see that in our domain folder now we have a bunch of classes and each of these classes represents a specific object. Now if I open one of them, like student, if I open student, you can see that there is a student class and this class has got fields which are represented like properties. So remember our discussion about properties, getters and setters. You can see that now I have a field called student ID, which is represented as a property. I have a field called name, and I have a field called registered. And I have another set of fields that are courtesy of relationships that uh, this table has with other tables. For example, this table has a relationship with course registrations table. So there is a field that is added which creates what we were calling collection data types. So again, remember our uh, topic on arrays and advanced collections. So this is a collection data type, meaning a student can have multiple course registrations or a student can have multiple payments. And that is how this is represented within Entity Framework. So this class called student represents the student object. And you can see that we have classes that represent each of the other objects. And you notice that I've just saved myself a, a bit of time. Instead of having to create these classes, and you can see that there's a bit of uh, uh, learning that you would have to do to create these classes correctly and have them use Entity Framework. But I just showed you a simple approach that you can use uh, 
to have Visual Studio auto-generate your classes if you have already created a database. Uh, of course, the other approach which I uh, talked about was database, uh, fa was uh, code first, in which case, if you have already created your classes within Visual Studio, you can then generate a database based on that. But let's uh, do it this way. I'll create another video in which I'll show you, if you already have classes, how do you then auto-generate a database based on those classes? So I just want to make some small change. Uh, you notice that uh, Entity Framework uh, tries to change the, de the, the names of the classes from plural to singular. So you can see that the class here is called student, yet the corresponding table within uh, SQL Server is students in plural. But sometimes Entity Framework is not able to do this correctly. Like you notice the cost table, when it changed the cost table from uh, plural to single, singular, it made it a cost. And we just want to change that. So you can see this is cost. So to do that again in Visual Studio is very simple. <coughs> Click on the object you want to change, press F2 on your keyboard, type the new name, and press enter. And of course, that will replace every occurrence of the name course up to and including the name of the file that contains the course object. And you can see that that has renamed all occurrences of course within uh, Visual Studio, so we do not have to worry about that. So there we have it, we have already created a bunch of classes. I just want to uh, draw your attention to one more thing. So you notice that there's a class called uh, School Context, and this is the class that is used to abstract. So it abstracts uh, the connection to your database. So ordinarily, if you, are not using, uh, if you are not using Entity Framework, you'll have to create your own connection. You will have to also create your own command You'll have to execute your command, retrieve the data, and then iterate through the items in your data. But this uh, DB context will abstract all that, and I will show you how this will be different if you are not using Entity Framework. So you notice that within here, again, we have uh, several DB sets, and this represent collections of objects from each of those tables. So let's go ahead and continue to build our application and see how we can proceed from here. So now we can save all that we have done, clean up our workspace, and go back to our solution. And now we want to create our business logic. So we want to create our business layer. So here, typically, and again, this is a matter of our preference or style, we create a folder that we call logic. And what we expect is within, within this folder called logic, we will have the, the logic for working with the different uh, objects within our solution. So for example, to work with students, uh, we will have a student logic uh, within here. And what that logic will enable us to do is within that student logic, we can add all the business processes that are to do with students. We can also, within that logic, add methods that we'll use to do things like adding a student, updating a student, and so on and so forth. So we add uh, logic right there. And then the next thing we need to do is uh, go ahead and add. So we can go ahead and add our first logic. Uh, so we add. And each of those logic, will add them as a class. So we create a new class. Call this new class student logic. Uh, click on add. And then I have to make sure this class is public. So remember your access modifiers. So I've made my class uh, public. So within this uh, uh, student logic class, this is where I want to put a bunch of methods that I can use to work with student objects. Remember, again, according to our application architecture, usually the presentation tier or tier talks to the uh, business layer, and the business layer is the one that talks to the data layer. So we want to set up the business layer to talk to the data layer, and then our presentation layer will talk to our uh, business layer. So let's go ahead and do that. 
So here in our business layer, so if you're using entity framework and you want to read, uh, write and update uh, objects, typically implement what are normally referred to as CRUD operations, which like we had indicated, these are creating, updating, uh, creating, reading, updating, and deleting items from your table. So if this is what you want to do using Entity Framework, this is how it works. So first you have to create uh, a context variable. So remember our context was called uh, school context. So actually before I do that, I have to do one more thing. So up to that point, I have my classes, I have my first uh, student logic. Uh, what I have to do is I have to install uh, entity framework. Remember entity framework that we talked about? I'll just uh, recap that. So remember entity framework that we talked about? We have to install entity framework within our solution. So we'll install entity framework within our entire solution so that then we can be able to use it. And to do that, to install entity framework within the entire solution, all you have to do is go to the tools menu, go to NuGet package manager, go to manage NuGet packages for the solution. Okay, you can see entity framework is already here. So click on entity framework, select all the projects within your solution. So I select all these projects within the solution. Then I choose that I want to install uh, entity framework within all of them. So I can uncheck uh, data because I already have it installed within data. So then I click on install. I click on OK here and then I accept. OK, and you can see from here that now entity framework is installed in all the projects within my solution. So I can now go back and begin to use entity framework. So the first thing I have to do before I can use Entity Framework uh, is again create that relationship between the different layers. So for example, the business layer uh, depends on the data layer and the presentation layer uh, depends on both the business layer and the data layer. So to do that, I have to add a couple of references. So I add a reference within the business layer to the data layer and I add a reference in the presentation layer to both the business layer and the data layer. So I simply go to references, right click, add a reference, uh, come to projects, and select data. Okay, I'm only selecting data to say the business layer is dependent on the data layer. I click on okay. Then I go to the presentation layer, again, right click, add a reference, go to projects, choose both business and data layer because remember presentation layer is at the very top and it depends on the uh, on the two of them then i click on ok maybe just a simple explanation for the reason why you need the references is for example the classes that you're going to use for example the student class is defined in the domain folder within the data layer so for you to use the student class within the business layer, you have to reference the data layer because that is where the class is defined. So now let's go ahead and see how you can implement uh, these operations using Entity Framework. So the first thing you do is you create a context. Uh, you can see school context is there. So I create a variable called school context. I'll take advantage of the suggestions I'm being given here. And usually this variable is made uh, private and read only. So I create a private read only variable called school context. Okay. Then I can now go ahead and begin to create my methods. So for example, if I want to just read uh, data from the student table, how does that work? So I'll create a method here. I call it public. So if I want to read uh, uh, all the students in the table. I create a method here called public. Then I use here I enumerable student. Remember the advanced collections. So this is an example of an advanced collection. So this will return 
a collection of several students. So usually this method is called get all, or you can say get students. And when you're calling this method, you don't need to pass any parameters. So here, if you're using entity framework, all that you have to write is uh, return school context dot students dot to list. And that's all. So if this method is invoked, it will be able to read a collection of all the students that are contained in our table. And I think before we go too far, let us demonstrate how do we use this method and the small code that we have just written in our console application to get a list of all the students in our table and display this. So then we can go now to the presentation. Remember, this is where now you have your uh, user interface. So because this is a command line interface, this is how we're going to use it. So within, within the program uh, file, we create an instance of the student logic. So here we create a private read-only variable called uh, student logic. Again, I'll just take advantage of the suggestions I'm being given. So a private read-only variable called uh, student logic, and then I need to retrieve a collection of students. So there is a keyword you can use in Visual Studio or in C Sharp called var, and you normally use this if you do not know the data type of the results that will be returned. So let me assume I do not know the data type of the results that will be returned. And then I say uh, student logic dot Okay, I seem to have a problem here because uh, I'm within a static method, so I have to make this variable also static. Okay, so then I can come and say uh, students is equal to uh, student logic dot get students. So what that will do is it will call the method within my uh, logic layer. So here's my logic layer, and this method returns a collection of students. So let me finish that. So what can I do with my collection of students? Uh, remember the for each loop. Remember the for each loop. I can use the for each loop to iterate. Iterate a collection data type. Okay? So I use the for each loop to go through a data type that is made up of several items and retrieve each of the items. Uh, if you've forgotten how to do this, you can go back and uh, revisit our lecture on uh, loops. So I'll just use it for each loop. And there's an advantage to the way this is done. So the collection is students. And that's all. So this for each loop will iterate through each of the students in my collection. And let me say I just want to print this out of the screen for demonstration purposes. So for each student, just print the student name. And you can see how object-oriented programming is coming into play. Remember we created a student class. So here's a student class. The student class has got an attribute name. So when I create a student object, I can be able to refer to this specific attribute simply by using dot notation. So when I say student.name, that will retrieve the name of a given student. Now let's run this code and see what we get. Okay, I have a small error because there's something that I need to do. Uh, so when I created my uh, domain with my classes, the system automatically added uh, a database connection. So remember we created a database connection. So what we have to do is we have to copy that database connection from the data project to the presentation uh, project. And that connection is found within the app.config file. So if you open the app.config file, you can see there is a connection string called school context, if you remember. So all we need to do is copy this then go to the presentation layer, so this presentation, 
open the app.config for the presentation layer and paste that uh, connection right here. That's all. Save my application. And I will attempt to run it again. And how beautiful is that? You can see with just that little amount of code, I already have an application that can be able to connect to my database, read and show me the names of the students. Let's just go to the database to verify that these are indeed the students in our table. So you remember we added some uh, fictitious data. So this is our database. If we right click students and select the data, you can see that these are the same students that are being shown. I'll just put them side by side so you can confirm. So you can see that these are the exact same students that are being read from the table. And you can see that that is very easy to accomplish using Entity Framework. Okay, so you can see how our three-tier approach is working uh, up to this point in a nutshell. So we have a data layer which contains our classes and the context as well as a connection string. And then we have a business logic layer where we have to create a logic that enables us to work with each of the different object types. So here we have student logic. So when we come to our application, which is represented here by a console application, all we need to do is create a variable that references our uh, logic and then use that variable to work with the data. So for example, you can see I'm easily able to retrieve all the students. So let's go ahead and demonstrate how we can be able to do the other crude operations uh, very quickly. So if I get back to my student uh, logic layer, so suppose I want to create a new student. How do I implement uh, student creation? Okay, and you notice what we said about the business layer. The reason why I'm putting this code here is if tomorrow I want to do a web interface, I don't have to redo this code. So let's do the code. So if I want to uh, add a new student, uh, you create a method similar to this one. Uh, uh, we call it add student. So when you want to add a student, you have to provide the student object. So that's the student object that you want to add. And uh, the addition of a new student object to a database, if you're using Entity Framework, will simply use the same, uh, the same context that we have created. So this would simply be something uh, like this. So it will be school context dot students dot add the student object that has been passed. And then we simply persist by calling save changes. How beautiful is that? So you notice that by simply adding those two lines of code, if somebody were to create a student object and pass it to this specific uh, method, this method will be able to persist that uh, student object to the database. So let's see how can you be able to use this uh, method in your application. So we'll come back here. So let's restructure our application in such a way that uh, we are able to uh, do different things. So for example here, uh, let me assume that I want to create a new student. So how would I create a new student? So uh, I'll create a student object. So remember this is object oriented programming. Call my student object student, uh, new student, like that. Then I can assign values to my student object. So remember that in our database, we only need three variables. We only need a student ID, a name, and the status of whether the student is registered or not. And remember that the student ID is auto-generated. So how do I do that? So I'll simply say student.name equals to, so I can use another uh, student, I can use another student, uh, the famous astronaut, uh, Buzz Aldrin. Then I will say his registration status <coughs> is false. 
meaning he is not yet registered. Okay, just uh, confirming that we cannot use the uh, variable student because there is al already another student object down here. So let's change this one and call it new student. So let's change this one to new student. All right, and then we also just rename these ones similarly, new student, and rename this one also similarly to new student. So what have we just done here? We have created a student object. Then after creating our student object, we will call our logic layer and pass the student object so that then the student object can be saved to the database. How do we do that? We simply say student logic dot add student and we pass our new student. That's all. So if we execute this code right now, what will happen is this new student will be added to our database uh, because we have a method here that we use for doing that uh, using entity framework. So let's see how this uh, uh, works. And then again, of course, here we have our for each loop that will print out all the students again from the database. Or maybe so that we can be able to see what's happening clearly. Uh, let's first of all comment out this code. Okay, then we just run this one. So finished executing. We can confirm first of all by going to the database. So here's the database, refresh F5. You notice that now we have a fourth student called Buzz Aldrin that has been added. And of course, again, if we came back and reran, so if we come back here and comment this code, and uncomment this code, Okay, so this one was a comment. And then run this again. You'll notice that the new list of students that is printed now includes the extra student that we've added. And that is how you can easily implement uh, addition of objects to your database if you're using uh, entity framework. Now let's do the other two without necessarily having to demonstrate each one of them one at a time. So we'll add uh, two more methods, one for updating a student and another one for deleting a student. So we'll do this very quickly. So if you want to update a student, this is the kind of method you will write. So when you're updating a student, you have to be passed a student object. So which student are you updating? So then how do I update a student given a, a, an object? Uh, the first thing I have to do is retrieve the student from the database. And this is what I have to do. Uh, actually, I don't need to do that because I'm using the same context. Because I'm using the same context, all I have to do is simply uh, persist the changes. Uh, persist the changes. And according to that, you actually don't need to pass an object of type student if you just want to update. We'll see how that works. Let's create another method very quickly for uh, deleting a student. So this is a classic example of where you have to receive the student object. So which student object are you deleting? And then we have to find the student. So we have to use var. Uh, let's use student in short. And then we have to say uh, school context dot students dot find. So look for the student using their student ID. Then once we find the student, no, actually that's not necessary. That's not correct. Uh, all we have to do is use the context to remove the student. So school context dot students dot remove uh, student. Then persist the changes using the context again. And that's all. 
So what we have done is we've added two more methods. So there's a method for updating a student in case we want to update a student. And the last one we have to do is suppose I want to retrieve a single student. So this one gets you several students. So if I want to retrieve a single student and this method returns an object of type student. Uh, so usually this will be get student. And the re retrieval is normally done using the primary key. So we have the primary key for our student table is student ID. So I think this is what I was confusing with. So how do we retrieve a student object from our database using our context? So we do that uh, very simply uh, this way. So we would have to say something like var uh, student equals to uh, use the context to find a student whose student ID is the ID you will have provided. And then once you found that student, uh, you can be able to return the student. Okay. So what this basically does is we create a student object based on a student record that we'll get in our database. And then we return that student object. So you notice that we have now uh, implemented methods that you can use to perform all the four basic database operations. If you want to create a student, there is a method we have just added called add student. And this is how you use entity framework to create a new student. If you want to read or retrieve a single student, there's this method called get student that will get you a specific student if you provide their student ID. And then we have uh, update. We have an update student method that will update a student record. Uh, and the last one is a delete method that will delete a student, again using entity framework. And I just wanted to show you the reverse of if you are not using entity framework, how would this work? But before I do that, let us uh, experiment with all these methods and see how they work in a real application. So let's go to our console application. And I think so that all this is very clear, we will delete this to clean up our working environment and then we'll do them one by one. So let's do all the crude operations one at a time. Uh, so the first one, we have already seen how you can create a student record. We created the student record uh, uh, Buzz Aldrin. If you've forgotten how that works, you can rewind the video and see that. So next, let's see how you can be able to read a specific single student. We already saw how you can be able to read all the students in a database. So let's see how you can be able to read a specific student. So of course, again, uh, we need the student's ID uh, to read the student. So this is the kind of thing that you will do. So you'll have a statement such as uh, var student equals to, then we use student logic dot get student, and we pass a student ID. So just for hypothetical uh, testing, let us use ID one, so that that will get us the student with ID one. And so suppose we want to see the details of this student, we can simply say, now, uh, student.name, for example. So you can see how we use our student logic layer to retrieve a student object, and we can be able to uh, get their name, for instance. So I'll just run this part. You can see that that gets us the first name, uh, which is the first student. Of course, if you alter this to uh, two, that will get you the second student. And you see that we are doing this using an object-oriented programming approach. So we are actually retrieving a student object. So that is how you'll be able to implement reading a specific object. Now let's see, suppose you want to update. Suppose you want to update a student record. So how do you accomplish updating? So the first thing you'll have to do is you have to retrieve the student and make the modification that you want to make the to, to the student, and then you can be able to persist the changes. So let's take an example. Suppose I want to modify the name of the student Bill Gates to have the full names William Gates, okay? So suppose that's what I want to do. This is how I'll do it. So 
This is how you do an update. So first, I retrieve the student equals use the logic dot get student and use the student ID. So that will retrieve the student you want to update. Then make the update. So I say student dot name equals to I modify the name. So I can change the name to now uh, the full name like that. And then all I have to do again is call my update method uh, within uh, student logic to have that updated. And that's all that you need to do. So let's test out and see if this works. So before we run the code, the student, ne the student name is Bill. Uh, so let's run the code and see what we get. Okay, so finished. We can go to the database and refresh. And you notice that the student's name has now changed to William. And simply that is how you can be able to implement an update. Uh, let's do the last one where we demonstrate how you can do a delete. So suppose you want to do a delete. How do you do a delete using Entity Framework? So again, because part of the code is similar to this, I will not delete that first, that first line. So first of all, you have to retrieve the record of the student that you want to delete. So let's take a simple example. Let's assume we want to delete uh, the record of the student Steve Jobs, okay? So Steve Jobs, the student ID is three. So in our code here, we simply need to say, get the student three. And you notice this will create an object, a student object with the ID three. Uh, just a second. Okay, that's fine. So then the next thing I need to do is simply call my student logic and say, uh, call the uh, delete student method and pass the student object. That's all. So my student uh, logic has got the code that is required for deleting a given student from my database and saving those changes. And I don't need to do anything else. So let's check that out before we run the code. So here we are, refresh. We have a student called Steve Jobs, uh, student ID three. Come back to our code. Let's execute our code. finished executing our code. We jump back to the database, refresh and see what has happened. Now you notice the student Steve Jobs has been deleted. And simply that is how you can be able to implement uh, deleting of data if you're using entity framework in a three-tiered architecture. Now let's do the last, the, let's do the last demonstration where we show you uh, how can you be able to implement uh, an example of a business process. And remember, the business process that we want to demonstrate here is the register student. So remember this business process where you register a student and registering the student simply means changing their status. And you only do that if the student has selected some units and they have made a payment. Okay, so how would we implement this uh, business rule or business process. So back again to Visual Studio, I go to student logic and this is where I will be able to implement that uh, business process. So I can add another method here and say this is public void uh, register student. And when you call register student, you have to pass a student object and this is what will happen. So remember, the registration of a student required several things to be done. So first of all, we have to check if student has selected units. And then we have to check if student has made payment. Okay. And then finally, once we are sure that the student has made payment, if both are true, then register student. And you notice that this corresponds to uh, the different activities within
our business process. So here's our business process. Student will pick the units. We'll check if the student has picked units. We'll check if the student has made payment. And then we'll register the student. So let's see how this could be done. Uh, so first of all, how do we check if the student has registered for units? Very simple. If you're using Entity Framework, we write a simple query that will return the units, or it will return a count of units that the student has registered for. So this is where link comes into play. So we create an integer variable called cost count. Uh, set this cost count to be uh, school context dot dot course registrations dot where so you can see I'm uh, writing a where clause C so you may need some time to learn how entity framework works and how link works dot student ID equals to student dot student id and then i add dot count okay i seem to have Okay, uh, that's something to do with the integer. So start with that and say here Okay, I see that that still doesn't get rid of the error. So let's just go back and try something different. Okay, and uh, what we do is first of all retrieve, so say to list, retrieve the courses before counting. I think we'll just uh, stick with counting and we'll see if that will work in a short while. Uh, again, so let's go to the next one where we check if the student has made any payment. And this is a tricky one where you have to compute, uh, compute the total fees that the student has paid. Uh, so you could come up with something like fee paid and we say uh, school context dot fee payments dot where uh, first of all begin by saying select so select F uh, F dot fee dot where uh, S Okay, I seem to have a problem with that. So let's use a simpler, let's use a simple uh, demonst for demonstration purposes. Let's use a simple approach where we don't try to compute the total fees, but we just count if the student has got any transactions. Uh, so we call this uh, payment account. Then we use the same approach. So school context dot fee payments dot where uh, f f dot uh, 
student ID is equal to the student ID of the student that has just been passed. Then uh, we also count that. And this will accomplish the same thing because all we want to make sure is the student has some transactions in the student table, in the fee payment table. And then lastly, so we will base our decision on whether to register the student or not on those two variables. And we can do that simply by using uh, an if statement. So we say if cost count is greater than zero, that means the student has selected some units and payment count is also greater than zero then we can go ahead and register the student and to register the student we simply say student dot registered equals true and we persist this uh, by simply calling the context like that okay we seem to have some error there Okay, I think the error is simple. It's because that's supposed to be an equal sign, uh, two equal signs for equality. Okay, so we can test out this code and see whether it is able to change the registration status of a student uh, depending on whether they picked some units and paid some fees or not. So let's go back here. So let's clean up our code and say here now we want to demonstrate registration business process so first we have to create a student object uh, so let's pick one of the students so let's pick the first student just for demonstration purposes and then we say this is the, the student that we want to register okay so we expect that if this student has made payment uh, and they have selected some units, then their registration status should change. So let's execute this. So the program executes, and let's confirm within SQL Server. So here is SQL Server. F5, you can see the registration status of student number one remains zero, uh, meaning the student has not been registered. And the reason for that is because our business process requires that you need to have uh, registered for some courses and you need to have made some payment. And if we go back to our database, uh, if we check course registrations, there's not even a single course registration. If we check fee payments, there's not even a single fee payment. So first of all, let's add a course registration and a fee payment for student ID 1, and then we see if our business process will execute. So right click, edit top 200 rows. So student ID is one. Let's assume they're registering for course ID one in semester one. That's all. And also let's make a payment for this student. So the student ID is one, student ID one, uh, semester ID one. Let's say they've made a payment of $100. That's all. So now student ID 1 has both a registration and a fee payment. So let's see now whether the student status will change when we execute our business process. So I come back here and again execute our program. Okay, program execution successful. Uh, get back to the database. Refresh. And you notice that now the registration status of the first student has changed, meaning our system was able to follow that business process, verify selection of units,
verify fee payment and successfully change the registration status of the student. And so that is it in a nutshell, how we will go about implementing a business process. Of course, in a real uh, application, you are likely to have several business processes. And again, in your solutions, I expect you to have uh, logic for dealing with all the different types of uh, objects. So for example, how do you add, update, and delete courses? For you to do that, you'll have to create another class called course logic. If I can just uh, do that. So you'll have to create another class called course logic, like that. And within this course logic, you will need to add statements. You'll need to add a bunch of statements for adding, updating, deleting, and manipulating course objects. And you'll need to do that for all the different objects that you have within your database. So I believe that uh, is an introduction just to show you how you can use Entity Framework, how you generate your classes, how you write your business logic layer, and how you create a three-tier or a three-tier application where you have a user interface that is working in conjunction with a business layer to be able to uh, uh, implement the logic of your application, which may entail some business processes and some basic uh, creating, reading, and so on types of operations. So in the next demonstration, I will go ahead and show you how we can be able to add a graphical user interface to this very same scenario and how we can be able to utilize the same logic and the same data layer to facilitate a graphical user interface uh, in addition to the console. So that's the end of this uh, lecture. Thank you.